Hello and welcome to another episode of the Juan on Juan podcast. I'm your host, Juan. Today we are talking about another esoteric subject, the Cathars. The Cathars were a Christian dualist or Gnostic revival movement that uh, was present in Southern Europe and Northern Italy and Southern France between the 12th and 14th century. They were uh, one of the first uh, groups to be persecuted by the Catholic Church for their beliefs, for their dualistic views of uh, Christianity. And go, again, this is esoteric. This is Gnostic. It goes against the the traditional narrative of how we view things today. And honestly, how we view things today derive from uh, groups like this. So not a lot is known of this group except very select things and in my esoteric wormhole which seems to be my life as of lately just a big wormhole researching different topics and i'll look into one thing and that opens up a whole another door into another thing and then another thing and it's just this it's exhausting so i came across andrew philip smith and his book the lost teaching of the cathars and he really it's individuals like this who look into things that other people won't. You know, there's not a lot of information out there. But if you really do look, you can find information. And Andrew was able to do this and really break down the Cathars and what they believed and who they were. Andrew writes a lot of material on the subject of Gnosticism. And I reached out to him to really talk about the Cathars because it interests me. And again, it early Christianity really does interest me in theology altogether and we talk about how Gnosticism has influenced Christianity today and modern society we break down some of his upcoming work and we also break down his book the lost teaching of the Cathars so without further ado this is the lost teaching of the Cathars with Andrew Philip Smith and we are live uh thank you so much for being on Andrew welcome to the show uh thanks Juan so today I wanted to talk to you, obviously, because I've been researching this line, uh, this line of research, uh, esoteric or whatever you want to call it, these different beliefs, uh, theology fascinates me. I was born and raised Christian, so obviously all this heresy has got my mind <laughs> going crazy, and I just find it so so uh you know so crazy that these beliefs that these people had and and uh how they were persecuted as well for these beliefs uh you know to the extent where they're some some way even wiped out and again it's it's fascinating so i wanted to ask you and i wanted to start off with this first of all can you tell people where they can find your work you've written numerous books and if i'm not mistaken you have a or you had a magazine or you run a website the Gnostic, I believe. Uh, can you f tell the people where they can find your work? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a, a somewhat creaky uh, website that looks like it belongs to the early 90s or something <laughs> called uh, andrewphillipsmith.com. It's uh, all one word, two L's in Philip. Uh, also, I have a small uh, publishing company, Bardic Press. Um, uh, yeah, Bardic Press, one word, dot com, and the uh, hyphen Gnostic dot com for the Gnostic Journal. That it, that is defunct. Uh, don't um, rule out uh, publishing another issue, but it doesn't seem to be happening any day soon. Um, but the uh, existing six issues are still in print. Um, nice square bound, solid slabs of Gnosticism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite, a, quite a range of materials, uh, interviews with everybody from academics to experimental musicians who've been in Gnosticism, article, fiction. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And Are you able to get that in the States, Andrew? Yeah, just order it through Amazon is the uh, easiest way. Okay, I'll check that out then. Um so I wanted to start off with this question. I ask it to everyone who comes on the podcast, and I believe it's a question we don't get enough. Uh, who is Andrew Philip Smith? <laughs> I 
thought you were going to ask the question about uh, shaving. That you... <laughs> <laughs> we can we, we can leave that one for the ending. <laughs> uh, who is Andrew Philip Smith? Um, well, that's my name. Uh, what was a more in-depth answer than that? <laughs> oh, I mean, you, you, uh, uh, feel free to elaborate. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Welsh, you know, I uh, don't know if everybody knows what Wales is, uh, but um, so Wales is the uh, sort of western uh, part of uh, Great Britain, and it's a separate country, well, it's a country that isn't a state, so, you know, the United Kingdom is England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, that's all starting to get on very shaky ground with the, with the um, EU withdrawal and uh, Scottish independence and everything. But uh, so I lived away for about 30 years, about 10 years in London, 10 years in, Al in Northern California, and 10 years in Ireland. And um, just two years ago, I moved back and uh, with my wife. And uh, at the moment, my grown up son, we're uh, living in a house that dates back to the end of the 18th century, um, about a mile from where I was actually born. Um, in this kind of odd area, which it, it used to be a village, but it got absorbed by uh, the town of Barry, which uh, grew up as an industrial port. And um, there's some old traditions in the area. There's some folklore about a, a werewolf uh, who was cursed by a witch. Um, there was a family of wizards who were buried in the local church. Uh, William Jenkins, the wizard, and his, uh, uh, his mother was a witch, according to the... Um, the folklore and uh, it's this funny sort of in-between area that now it's you know very urban but uh, it goes back uh, you know, a lot further than the, um, the the rest of Barry and uh, the Romans were here they had uh, uh, docks in, in Barry in the Roman period uh, so uh, it, you know how it is sometimes when you grow up in a place and you just take it for granted and it's the most boring place you can think of and you just want to get away you know uh, but then I've come back to it and discovered it's a lot more interesting than I'd ever given it credit for. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. um, and so you know I, I would describe myself as an esotericist um, uh, you know people often ask me are you a Gnostic and I usually kind of word my way around that by saying well I'm happy for people to call me a Gnostic but uh, you know I don't make any great claims myself uh, about it but um uh you know narcissism is the subject of most of my books uh i'm working on a novel at the moment actually um with which, which is very explicitly gnostic uh, and the gurdjieff work was a big part of my adult life uh, i'm interested in magic as well um and uh, i'm sitting in my study uh, you know, all the every wall has a it's filled with bookshelves basically. And, uh, you know, looking around at the wide range of <laughs> esoterica and you know, everything from you know two rows of alchemy books. Uh, uh, there's some Jung, uh, about two massive bookshelves full of magical stuff. Another two massive bookshelves full of uh, Christian history gnostic stuff so so yeah an no, esotericist is what i'm uh, happy with and a writer as well uh this new uh novel that you're working on uh is it fiction non-fiction uh can you tell a little bit about that can you even talk about it yeah i'm i i, I will touch on it a little bit i'm a bit reluctant because i'm in the middle of doing it uh and a little bit reluctant, um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's actually explicitly Gnostic, it, rather than you, you know using some of the structures of Gnosticism, you know, for example, like the Matrix did, or you know, something like that. It's actually about a young guy who um, gets, at the moment, uh, gets left an ancient manuscript and uh, gets involved with a Gnostic group in London, uh, and gets the idea that uh, from 
the group that he might be a kind of reincarnation of Simon Magus, and he goes out looking for uh, Helen, his uh, prostitute, um, that he's meant to liberate <laughs> the brothel. I don't know if you know the, the story of Simon Magus. I've, I've heard of it, but I've, I'm not familiar with it, no. Yeah, well, this, um, you, know, you know, if you grew up as a Christian, you know about Simon Magus from uh, the Acts of the Apostles, where he uh, tried to buy his way to Christianity and you know, was offering money to get uh, spiritual favors. And that's, you know, the term simony is uh, it's used within the church as, uh, you know, the crime of uh, paying for spiritual favors or spiritual office or whatever. But um, that's so funny gets... you say that, Andrew. I'm sorry to interrupt you because that sounds like. <laughs> That sounds like the church. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when you get religion and money, uh, (laughs) they combine in many interesting ways. Yes, yes. uh, Yeah, exactly. And that's that's my problem with religion, uh, you know, the political aspect of it. And then obviously, you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of occult connections as well that people want to turn a blind eye and. yeah, <laughs> but I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead and continue. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but there's a much more interesting story about Simon. And, you know, I guess he was a historical person um, and he was seen as, a, you know, a heresiarch, a founder of heresies by the church fathers who, uh, you know, unwittingly sort of preserved a lot of this information for us by writing these diatribes against uh, heresies. Sort of second, third centuries. Um, but there's a story about uh, Simon. He went into a brothel in Antioch and he found a woman called Helen, who was uh, the reincarnation of Helen of Troy, who in turn was this um, uh, the incarnation of this uh, divine feminine figure. And so Simon sort of buys her out uh, of her slavery in the brothel and they become a, a couple in this kind of pairing that's uh, quite familiar in Gnosticism. So in the, in the novel, I, I mean, and, and you, you get these other um, pieces of Gnostic writing which uh, address the soul as a female figure who was fallen from grace and now she's being abused by thieves and uh, fornicators and uh, uh, has to um, get out of her situation and uh, in the Exegesis on the Soul, which is uh, one of the Gnostic writings uh, found in Nag Hammadi in 1945, uh, that has quite a sort of developed uh, myth of the soul. And I actually did a short book about that and uh, A Hymn of the Pearl, another kind of similar writing about the soul being stranded in the material world and uh, having to return. Uh, so, so I'm using this in, in the novel, but I'm, I'm trying to play against the type you know uh, you imagine this you know grand sort of romantic narrative uh, of a woman being rescued by the great white knight who turns up uh, so I'm trying to turn that around a bit and um, play with the reader's expectations and uh, so it, and it's set in 1990s London and uh, Late second, early third century Alexandria as well. So there's a certain kind of sort of time slip uh, aspect going on too. So I'm really, I'm really enjoying writing it, and it, I, you know, I'm only halfway through the first draft at the moment. So there's a lot of work to do on it, so, um, but it's re- it's really refreshing to just be, you know, I just sit down and I write, you know, thousand, two thousand words without having to look things up like I have to do with yeah. <laughs> the other books. I bet, because it just makes me wonder how different uh, Gnosticism would be if the Nag Hammadi was never discovered. Because there's so many uh, texts that that they that they quote from there. You know, all the re- a lot of research comes from those from that library, and it's amazing. Yeah, well, you can actually get some idea of um, what. Uh scholars thought about Gnosticism before the discovery of uh, Nag Hammadi. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, the uh, 
like I said, there were the, the heresiologists, the church fathers of the second, third century. They left a lot of information, but because these are diatribes and you know, polemics against uh, Gnostics and other so-called heretical groups, um, you can't be sure how truthfully they're representing the actual beliefs of the Gnostics. And um, so, it, it was in the Nag Hammadi collections, and you know, this was twelve codices, so uh, manuscript books. Uh, Containing you know, 40 odd uh, texts, uh, you can actually see, read, you know, what the Gnostics uh, themselves wrote. And we, we did have sort of a handful of Gnostic writings before the discovery of Nakhamdi, things like the Pistis Sophia, even the version of the Apocryphon of John and the Gospel of Mary. Um, but uh, you know, the scholarship has come on so much, uh, and. Uh, which isn't with its, without its own problems, because then you get scholars looking at you know, even the very concept of Gnosticism, wondering whether this is even a useful way of looking at this material that we have and the groups and everything. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So you spoke about how these um, heresiologists, or however you want to call them, uh, you know, you have they wrote it from a biased standpoint and, you know, they say Victor's always write history and it's like Irenaeus would write about the Gnostics, but what he would say were, were things from his point of view again, cause they're from the church. So obviously it didn't fit their narrative. So they're going to write what they're going to write. And it's going to be a bit biased as well. You know, you had that aspect of it. Yeah, sure. And I mean, some of the, um, the name is escaping me, but there was a fourth century writer who was uh, absolutely, completely biased and just ridiculous. He has this long list of heresies, including like paganism is a heresy, <laughs> you, know, like, yeah. which, you know, in the ancient world preceded Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but on the other hand, you know, these, those, these were intellectuals you know Irenaeus even Irenaeus had his own kind of um, platonic uh, Christian myth which wasn't in certain ways wasn't you know a hundred miles away from uh, Gnostic myths and they can't absolutely misrepresent these groups because first of all um, they're giving you this information so that you can recognize what heresy is because uh, Irenaeus, he went, he was um, uh, staying in the town of Lyon in France, which was a Lugdunum, a Roman town, <coughs> excuse me, at the time. And he he went along to the church there, and he found that there were Valentinian Gnostics uh, taking part in the ordinary church practices of the time. And he was pretty disturbed about this because they, the, the Valentinians were happy to go along with uh, what the sort of Orthodox, you know, uh, proto-Catholic uh, Christians were saying, but they read their own inner meanings into the uh, Gospels. So his, that was his impetus for writing about all this stuff. You know, so he he wanted people to be able to recognise what a heresy was, and so if you do, if he's doing that, he has to report them somewhat accurately. You know, just well, th to, that's the thing, and and Lawrence. Uh, made a comparison to this because you're talking about that they that they had their own set of Gnostic beliefs and a lot of these early Gnostic sects uh, they were they were all underground so it was like one one specific Gnostics were talking about the other Gnostics that were underground as well uh, that they were wrong so it's like they're going back and forth but at the end of the day they're all from the underground, you know, they're all heretical and they all have these different, because obviously that, you know, there's different types of Gnostics and one, you know, some, a group said this and then the other group didn't, uh, uh, agree with them. But again, at the end of the day, they're all, uh, all their beliefs are heretical, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, that, again, that's very typical, not only of religion, but of, you know, groups, <laughs> in all spheres of uh, human activity, you know, from politics uh, to religion, to esotericism, to you know, chess clubs, whatever. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> humans formed groups and other... Uh, 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 do you know the, uh, the Monty Python movie Life of Brian? 
I do not know. Oh, that's really worth uh, watching. It's uh, about um, uh, it's set in the time of Jesus, and uh, uh, there's a boy called Brian <laughs> who gets taken up as the Messiah quite uh, against his will. And um, but the, uh, the, there are some revolutionary groups at the time, and um, the the Judean popular front, and and, and you know, somebody meets the Judean popular front, and said, "Are you the Judean?" popular front and says no no they're splitters we're the judean popular people's front <laughs> <laughs> and so um so yeah you do find uh, you know diatribes within gnostic writings against other gnostics and you know there's one of the things that makes them interesting is that there was a wide variety of beliefs and explanations uh, you know every of Gnostic gospel, every Gnostic writing has a different take on um, the Gnostic myth and uh, you know how you should view the world, how you should view scripture, uh, you know, how what how the human being is uh, made up, you know, body, soul, spirit, or is it just uh, you know, do you have different kinds of soul, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's one part of the interesting side of Gnosticism. It never, well, I, I can actually give you, <laughs> now I'm saying this, I can think of an exception, some exceptions, but uh, it never really became a developed uh, mainstream religion. So it never had to deal, you know, with all defining the, the criticism true, true dogma and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Absolutely. Um, so we can work this in, our, in my next question. Uh, what got you into this type of research and this line of research? Because obviously, esoterica, it's not for everybody. Uh, me even, I was taught, I was having an episode uh, yesterday, and it seems that these like last four episodes that I've done have all been heretical, and I'm, I'm all heresied out, and <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to. Uh, to take a little break after this from you know heresies and, and talk about different subjects because again it's just it's a lot of information I'm taking in and it's blowing my mind. Uh, I actually did an episode yesterday with Alex Rivera, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that and uh, we talked about a lot, a lot of things, and I was like, man, it. it at the end of the day, my issue with it all is, you know, what is what. We can't all be right. And again, I'm not saying I believe all of it. You know, you have these people, I'll have conversations, and I can respect different beliefs. You can tell me you believe something, you can tell me the earth is flat. And I'll agree to disagree, and I'll, you know, I'll respect your beliefs for that, but I won't attack you. Yeah, but I've had conversations with people where uh, they want to attack me. You know, they ask me, oh, you know, what's your podcast about? And I, I'm kind of hesitant to sometimes answer that because my podcast isn't just about esoterica. You know, I have other subjects as well. Um, but obviously there's there's a there's an audience for everything. It's not going to resonate with everyone. And I feel that when they come across these episodes that I'm going to be putting out, you know, every now and again about theology and about heretical things they're going to look at me differently but at the same time you know it's it's the information is there and if you don't learn your history uh, they say you know you're bound to repeat it and it's all very fascinating to me but back to the question what got you into this type of research and uh, how did you start and when did you start because i know you've put a lot of hours into this uh yeah well gnosticism itself um got into, into that through, um, through the Gurdjieff work, which is a form of esotericism uh, found in the, from the sort of early 20th century. Um, and there was a, a, a writer and teacher called uh, Maurice Nicholl, um, who was, he was a sort of a posh Scottish background. So to all intents and purpose, uh, you know, kind of posh Englishman um, who, uh, I can't, I'm trying to think when he was born, probably the end of the 19th century. I mean, he was in the First World War and um, he was a pupil of Jung, actually. And then he uh, got involved with Gurdjieff, Andrew Spensky, 
uh, who was one of Gurdjieff's chief pupils and a writer and esotericist in his own right as well. And he wrote uh, two books called uh, The New Man and The Mark, which um, gave esoteric interpretations of the Gospels. And uh, so I found this really fascinating. And, uh, you, you know, I have a sort of Christian background, but it wasn't very intensive. Uh, and when, when I was about 10 years old, I kind of refused to get confirmed into the church in Wales. And I did go to this um, uh, Baptist church a little bit, but then I gave up with that as well. So and the UK is a really secular place, you know, um, most of my sort of school friends uh, would be atheists. You know. um, but I, and I was never particularly keen on churches, but still, you know, um, I could see that there was something there in the Bible. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I was very interested in this sort of esoteric interpretation of the Gospels. And then I, I kind of imagined that, okay, I could, read one or two books about the you know scholarship of the new testament or the bible in general or about uh, you know, the historical jesus to get a kind of handle on it and um you know it's like a bottomless pit uh, it's, a, can, it's a wormhole <laughs> it is yeah yeah so um and it was a good this was you know, like the end of the 90s when the internet was really taking over. And you had these amazing um, email discussion groups that were filled with, uh, you know, the top scholars on um, New Testament scholarship and other things and other subjects. And, uh, you know, as long as you kept to, you know, to sort of academic protocols, you could ask anything and discuss anything. And um, there's one... Uh, scholar in particular Steve Davies I really liked his work and the way that he approached things and I've uh, republished some of his books through Bardic Press um, but uh, yeah so and, and when so okay so I was also I've always been fascinated by the idea of sort of lost works you know like uh, lost gospels or lost sayings of Jesus you know, all these sayings attributed to Jesus that aren't found in the, in the New Testament. And uh, where do they come from? How kind of how well do they represent what Jesus might have said? And how well do the sayings in the New Testament represent uh, what Jesus might have said? So, so I got involved in the whole, um, you know, paraphernalia of uh, New Testament scholarship. And then I came across the Gnostics because, you know, if you interest in esotericism uh, and particularly before the internet kind of took over you'd see references to the Gnostics without really knowing much about who they were and of course I you know I bought a copy of the Mark Handy Library in English and um, the, the Gospel of Thomas you know that's really very immediate to read it you know it's sort of explicitly esoteric and it reads a lot of it reads like an esoteric version of the kind of sayings you get in the uh, canonical gospels and then the gospel of philip is fascinating exegesis on the soul but a lot of the stuff you know is really hard uh, you look at this and it seems so different to the new testament you know there's long lists of archons who rule different parts of the body and um, these strangely named abstract entities you know who are in the translation have got these uh, weird greek names it, Ennoia and Protonoia and uh, uh, or Yaldabaoth as barbarous names and um, it's absolutely you know my experience was it was absolutely mystifying <laughs> yeah <laughs> it so, is you, you know, I, I and, find and that having, so fascinating the the, yeah. the demonology and all these different uh, again it's and touching on what you said a little bit earlier you know the, these sayings that weren't record that are in the new testament but again at the end of the day andrew who decides who decides what's canonical and what's not canonical so again the church so what what's not canonical is going to be discredited why because it's not in <laughs> the official uh you know text for them and it's going to be discredited 
And again, it just makes you, in a way, look at things in a, in a biased form because when you're reading these texts, how much credibility can you give to them, you know, and how much credibility do they deserve or, 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 you know what I mean? It's, it's very, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like sort of historical, that historical veracity as to, you know, who Jesus was or that, that kind of thing. Or... Well, yeah. Well, again, what fascinates me, it's like the church says, no, this is, these are the gospels. These are the ones that, matter you know this is what jesus said and then you obviously you have the other side of the coin <laughs> the gospel of judas which is also fascinates me which paints a completely different picture but at the end of the day it's a gnostic text so you know what i mean can you even give it credibility because the gospel of judas flips everything on its head you know absolutely everything so at the end of the day it makes you look and go well are these texts, do they even matter? You know, that's the way I see it. It's like, do they matter? Do they not? But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, they're there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, um, I mean, you have to ask, in, in what way does, uh, you know, would they matter? Um, they, I mean, I think the way to approach them is to try and work out what they're saying and then see, you know, does that, resonates with you because um, because you know in terms of uh historical authenticity you know the four gospels in the new testament um been pretty well demolished by, <laughs> by yeah. ev- you know everything's been um, analyzed and you know matthew and luke they're basically two new versions of the gospel of mark with added stuff uh um and for, you know, if you're a kind of mainstream Christian, it is very important, you know, for most mainstream Christians that Jesus really did come down in the flesh and he really was the son of God and he really was crucified and uh, uh, really was a real resurrection. Um, but if you're not so wedded to these very literal um, interpretations, um, you know, my, my approach is you can, you know, it's like wearing different sets of clothes. Uh, you can try... You can take the approach of the Gospel of Judas and see where that leads you, see what it's trying to teach you, and then you can go to the Gospel of Philip, which uh, you know is quite different in many ways. And, um, and I think you know when you were saying you were saying something about um, you, you know that we have so much stuff now and everything, um, uh, and that's you know, you know that's a real sort of hallmark of our age. Um, that we're kind of just inundated with information and we have, you know, more knowledge about, um, you know, all these different uh, civilizations and cultures through, throughout the ages, you know, than any uh, stage of humanity has had. Before. Yeah, that's, that's technology. That's We're approaching that singularity where it fascinates me. I, I also do, I had an episode with, this guy who goes around ancient, ancient uh, megalithic structures around the world, and he studies them, and it's crazy the amount of knowledge these these people had at that time, and it makes you wonder where they got it from. Because right now, you know, I can look your work up, I can look anything up from my from a supercomputer in my pocket, my phone. And I can find any information that I want at any point in time. How did they do it back then? You know, how did they navigate? Well, they looked at the stars. Well, how did they know that the stars led them led them to where it was, or even how some of the you know the Mayans they had such an extensive knowledge of the stars and even the Egyptians and all these ancient cultures. And it's like you said, yeah, we are in an age where we do have a lot of information available to us and. More than you know, more information than any point in time. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, and it's um, it, in some ways I think there are you know, many similarities between our time and sort of the time of late antiquity. So you know, the second, third, fourth centuries on onwards, um, when the Roman Empire. You know, reached its peak and then started to decline, 
and um, it had already taken over the Hellenistic Empire that had been founded by uh, Alexander the Great and the generals that followed him. And so people, at least in the, you know, in the cities, the uh, Greek and Roman cities, uh, they had access to all sorts of different religions from different uh, countries and different cultures. Uh, so instead of just growing up with their local gods, you know, they had the Roman gods who were explicitly modeled after the, uh, the Greek gods, uh, gods from, uh, you know, Asia, even, you know, like Dionysus thought to have come from Asia, even, you know, Indian gods, uh, things like Attis and Cybele and the great mother and, um, you had, and the Egyptian, you know, the whole, um, range of Egyptian culture, uh, with, uh, you know, Alexandria, uh, was built you know, as a Greek city and it had this sort of mashup of, uh, Greek culture, Egyptian culture. There's a huge, uh, Jewish, uh, colony there. And, uh, so it was very much a meeting of different cultures with, you know, some of the same problems that we have now, you know, how do you absorb all that, uh, how do you find meaning when you know there's so just so much stuff sloshing around everywhere yeah and you you can see that you know, with postmodernism, um which, which gets a very bad rap quite rightly in, in many ways but uh, i find you know it has some many interesting aspects to it you know uh you know that all the relativism uh and um you know, the uh, kind of inability to state that any particular form of culture is really superior to any other. Uh, th those are quite, uh, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. And, uh, and then, you, see, you know, it's having this effect on truth, you know, uh, so-called truth. We're living in this post-truth world. And, uh, you know, to take a kind of non-controversial example, like Putin and Russia, and um, you know, the way that, um, that these sort of counter narratives are just created, you know, the, mm -hmm. they create a story about, OK, this is why this is how, you know, this sort of disaster has happened or something. And then they come up with another story. Which Conspir contradictory. Conspiracy theories, Andrew. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is really quite well attested and quite deliberate with uh, like, for, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> That's why I chose Putin as a sort of non-controversial uh, example of it. Yeah. Uh, it's a deliberate technique, and uh, you know there are political leaders in the West who have adopted. <laughs> well, yeah, fake <laughs> news. Techniques. You know, yeah, it happens. Yeah. I can yeah. agree with that. I wanted to get your input on that. Uh, when it comes to this line of research, uh, obviously there is. When it comes to any scripture, and I said this before, uh, there is a mystical comprehension as well as a literal comprehension, and I feel that. Uh, there's such a thin line between that because you have people who take these things as literal, literally how it is, but there's a lot of sim symbology, uh, symbolism and iconography and all these things. And it's, it's like you said, how do you find your way with all this information? You know, because there is always another, another side of the coin, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> when we get into the Cathars, I mean, you'll see the different beliefs that they had. Um, but yeah, I mean, how do you how do you find your way with all of this? You know, how do you distinguish what's right and what's wrong? It's it's very interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, through experience, you know, um, uh, you know, because that's uh, you know one side of Gnosticism that I haven't really touched upon yet is the you know this idea of gnosis as sort of experiential uh, knowledge. Of the divine, um, so in contrast to sort of faith-based Christianity, where you know, like in the Gospel of John, um, you got uh, Thomas uh, doesn't uh, believe that uh, Jesus is back, you know, so Jesus has him touch his wounds, and you know, and then he says, oh, "Blessed are those um, who do not see and believe." Uh, so, you know, if you have faith, uh, you don't have to actually experience things yourself mm -hmm. you just rely mm -hmm. on 
authority. You know, that's the most sort of extreme version of it. But, Ter- uh, Terrence McKenna talks about that story and he compares it to life. And if in life you are wise enough, because he was the only one uh, pretty much wise enough to question it. And this com- and this can relate to life as in if you question everything, they just might let you touch the wounds to see and show you something you, you couldn't you, that, that you didn't know if you hadn't a question it because again it comes down uh, there's everybody who there's people I mean I, I'm in the in the states this this pretty much propaganda almost that they just they'll take what the media tells them and they'll they'll you know they'll live by that and they'll cuddle that and and that's that's what it is and they don't question it you know what I mean and and yet you're right uh, it can be seen everywhere in the world really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some scholars have thought, you know, the, with the Doubting Thomas episode of the Gospel of John, that that's actually a sort of an attack on the community that was involved with the Gospel of Thomas and the you know, figure of Thomas, uh, the apostle, uh, that actually, you know, rather it being an example of, uh, you know, a way to deal with spirituality through your own experience you know by yeah. requiring that you touch the wounds you know um it's actually that was an example of what you shouldn't do you know <laughs> and that they were having an, you know they were attacking the uh yeah <laughs> they <laughs> so shouldn't look, doubt look these, you look shouldn't. these bozos who don't have enough faith because they, yeah, to... <laughs> they say you shouldn't you shouldn't test god you know you shouldn't test him and and in a way he was he was like man i don't believe it i just seen this guy who was dead three days ago and they're like no bro he's back and, <laughs> and he comes out and he's like hey man here you go um but yeah it's very interesting uh i wanted to get into obviously i'm gonna name this episode the lost teaching of the cathars uh can we get a little bit into who the Cathars were? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Cathars uh, were a group or several groups of Christian heretics in the Middle Ages in the south of France and the north of Italy. And um, so we're talking kind of... Uh, of the 13th, 14th centuries, really, when, when they thrived. And they kind of just seemed to appear out of nowhere. And so this was a region uh, known as the Languedoc, um, which was quite a kind of an anarchic region. That they didn't have a king. And uh, and uh, France at that time, France was just the northern part of uh, today's France. Uh, so the, the northern kingdom was called France. And then they had all these different sort of petty kingdoms and local aristocrats who were ruling and it you know wasn't a terribly hierarchical society um and then some, somehow and you know from the limited information that we have uh, it seems almost from nowhere you f- suddenly you find these cathars who were wandering around and they have this different version of christianity and so th- this was a time when this you know this is preceding uh, the Reformation and Protestantism, and uh, nearly just about everybody in Western Europe was Catholic. You know, the whole of Britain, you know, of course, you know, Ireland, but uh, everywhere was Catholic. Uh, and you, but you, you start having these odd little, uh, somewhat heretical groups appearing. Uh, like you have the, the Waldensians, who aren't really esoteric. Um, and not all that interesting, but um, they, their leader was a man called Waldo, and um, they were kind of like a sort of proto-Protestant group who were in the same sort of area around uh, northern Italy and I think Switzerland. Um, but uh, so the Cathars, they had a kind of Gnostic myth, um, which in its way was very medieval, involving uh, the fall of the angels, you know, and the uh, Satan falling from heaven, um, but it had this very Gnostic slant on it. Um, but heaven was just a spiritual world, so they fall into this uh, material world, and the spirits of these angels get trapped in the material world, and uh, Adam and Eve get created to, as sort of vessels for these spirits, and 
So the situation of humanity is that we have these uh, sort of sparks of spirit or angels within us, and we're trying to liberate them to get them to return back to the spiritual, immaterial, heavenly realm to restore it. And you do that through becoming initiated as a Cathar. And uh, the Cathars believed in reincarnation, including uh, metempsychosis, uh, which is reincarnation that means you can also be reincarnated as an animal as well uh, so if you didn't manage to um, liberate your spirit uh, in this lifetime it would go through to another lifetime and maybe then you'd meet a cathar and get initiated take the consolamentum this ritual that they used uh, which involved the holy spirit descending on you and um, put you under certain uh, obligations you know like not eating meat uh, being celibate and um, uh, kind of wandering around teaching and pescatarians so, as well right yes yeah yeah pescatarians um, uh, and so the thing is that they were very well liked even by most of the ordinary catholics in the area because uh that the, you know they did they lived up to their ideals um whereas it was a very corrupt time for the catholic church in in general and um, so, so they presented a problem to um, the Catholic Church. Uh, was, they were, first of all, they were heretics, uh, you know, and that's a no-no, you know, just by definition. Then uh, people preferred the Cathars to um, to many of the uh, Catholic priests that they uh, came across. Uh, so there was the threat that. Um, Catharism might develop and you know, take uh, power away from the church. So you get a number of initiatives on the behalf of the Catholic Church to try and sort out the situation. And initially, these weren't too bad. You had, um, for example, St. Dominic was basically kind of copying the way that the Cathars did things about just wandering you know, around and uh, talking to people and preaching and teaching. So, okay, you, they were trying to set a counterexample by beating the Cathars at their own game, but that wasn't working well enough. And um, then you have uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, who was, uh, he was involved with the setting up of the Knights Templars and also with the kind of um, development of Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a sort of a feminine almost as this kind of divine feminine figure, you know, as this maternal figure, which sort of plugged a gap in the uh, Christianity of the time, which, you know, which, of course, Christianity tends to be a very masculine religion because it has yes. Jesus and the 12 male apostles, you know, and then um, male priests, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so by developing Mary as this... Know, more somewhat more divine figure Bernard of Claveau was quite involved in making the church more um, attractive so all you know all those were and he was something of an esotericist himself Bernard of Claveau uh, uh, he's a very kind of divisive figure for me really but uh, anyway so um, okay so those aren't bad things but then it wasn't working well enough so um, they what do they do they Go and declare a crusade on the uh, Languedoc area, and um, they basically tell the you know the, the king of France, uh, if you go, if if you get all your noblemen to go down there, they can see any any land that they can seize, they can claim for themselves, and uh, you know you can basically annex the area to be part of your kingdom. And so this so uh, this crusade set out from uh, the north of France down to the south of France, you know, the, these were, it was the first time that uh, crusade had been declared against uh, Christians in, you know, in Europe. Uh, so, you know, they go down to um, the Languedoc and cities uh, like uh, Carcassonne and were, were under siege, you know, and this had the, all the horrific aspects of medieval warfare and atrocities and um but they did it you know it took uh, a few decades but uh they basically wiped out the uh, native 
aristocracy, uh, wiped out the Cathars, and um, they developed a, yet another institution to deal with, uh, specifically with the kind of heresies that you found in the Cathars, uh, called the Inquisition, which is uh, you know, obviously very famous. And um, they came up with all these techniques of uh, recording. They, they would interview people. Uh, they'd have a scribe writing down what the uh, interviewee said, and then they would go and cross-reference this, the interview with uh, what some, some, somebody else said in another village, and they would come up with a list of names of these Cathars who were traveling around. And then they would be hunted down, you know, they would have some kind of trial, and uh, they'd be burned at the stake. Uh, wow. And the kind of techniques that they've developed became really influential in, um, you know, it's basically a form of totalitarianism. Uh, and so, you know, the kind of techniques that the Stasi or the KGB used, uh, uh, you know, those were developed to, to oppose the Cathars, who were definitely very peaceful people, you know. Yeah. Um, so they're they're the Gnostics. What what really intrigued me about them, and the more I look into it, and it's a wormhole, uh, is that they considered the Old Testament as the work of demons, just like the Bogomils. That they saw this, and and they obviously, you know, they have Rex Mundi, uh, you know, the the the, the fake god. And, the rule of the, you know, the, the demiurge, the, 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 you know, Gnostic beliefs, and they believe, and again, how others believe Yahweh being the God of the Old Testament. And the more I look into it, because the Old Testament is so dark and has so many evil things, I'm kind of starting to, to believe that it is the work of, of demons in a way. <laughs> Because, again, the more I, I'll look into one thing and then that's a wormhole and that goes into another. And I'm like, man, maybe these guys were right. And the it's amazing that they prosecuted and uh, uh, persecuted these these early Christian sects. But then, for example, the, the Roman Empire, you know, they, they started Catholic. Uh, they saw the people were leaving and then they adopted Christianity. So it's like they do things that will work best for them. And again, at the end of the day, it comes to it makes you think uh, what's right and what's not, you know. But I just thought that was very interesting about them. And they also can you touch a little bit on their beliefs? Obviously, they were pescatarians with certain fish. Can you touch a little bit what they believed as far as the spirits of the angels? Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, well, you know, I touched on the the myth that they had uh, about the fall of, of Satan and the angels and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it is very Gnostic, uh, and it's pretty dualist as well. And um, uh, like du dualism is a term that you know refers to all sorts of different things. Like you think of Cartesian dualism. About uh, mind and uh, matter, uh, dualism there. But so uh, their, their their dualism is a very Gnostic dualism between spirit and matter. So that their approach was that the um, you know the world, the material world that we live in, uh, is kind of inherently opposed or opposite to the spiritual realm realm of heaven um, and that so you know spirit is kind of trapped in matter and it has to be liberated and they um, yeah so, so when I wrote this book uh, Lost Teachings of the Cathars uh, you know I'd read a few books about the Cathars and there you know there are several really good books about the Cathars but they're all about um, the history of the uh, the crusade the uh, Albigensian crusade and the Languedoc and uh, all the political dealings that were going on, and um, none of them really touched very much on what the Cathars actually did and uh, you know, what they believed. And 
practiced. Uh, so that that was I, that was the sort of defect I was trying to remedy with my book, and then you know also look at uh, what people later later on have made of the cathars in terms of esoteric teachings and stuff. Um, but they um, yeah, so there were kind of two kinds of uh, cathars. The ordinary believers, they they were just ordinary people who had very few restrictions placed on them. Uh, you know, they could have sex, they could have families. Uh, they the, the only kind of real practice that they had was if they saw a cathar perfect, which was the um, sort of the, the cathar. Uh, Elite, uh, they had they had to give them a, a greeting called the melioramentum, um, and that was about it. You know, you could be a Catholic believer, you could live uh, without uh, being married, you could li- you know live with your partner without being married, have kids, just live an ordinary life. Um, but if you became a perfect, you went through this uh, consolamentum rite, um, where the Holy Spirit descended on you. And then you had all these restrictions that you had to live up to. Uh, and uh, in, incidentally, when, when you were mentioning their attitude towards the Old Testament, um, uh, no, they didn't like the Old Testament very much in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it was the Gospel of John. That was yeah, the they Bible. regarded that as the highest, uh, uh, you know, scripture. Um, I was going to say that, but I wasn't sure if it was them or not, because, again, I got so many things in my head. <laughs> yeah, okay, I kind of mix bit, them all up. <laughs> yeah. It can get bewildering when you have you know, so many different takes on it. On it. Um, but they, they actually, and so so they had this structure. Um, so if you were perfect, you could initiate somebody, uh, uh, give them the consolamentum, right, and then they would become a perfect. Um, and... But if you didn't keep your vows, you know, if you ate meat or you had sex or killed somebody or whatever, not only would you lose your own status as a perfect, but everybody that you you had initiated and then everybody that, that they had initiated, they would lose their status wow. as a perfect. <laughs> and they would have to be re, reconsoled and reinitiated. Um, so that that's quite an interesting way to do things because it puts a lot of responsibility on people to actually... You know, keep their vows and to live up to what they're doing, and it uh, and it's uh, you know, it's not authority based. Um, it, it's not that you're going to go through, you know, be put in front of a church tribunal if you uh, eat meat or whatever. It means that every, everybody who's placed their trust in you is going to have to find somebody else to uh, give them the consolamentum ritual again. And, Can you imagine uh, that what that was like, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And sometimes it did cause problems because, um, you, you know, the story behind it was uh, that this went all the way back to Jesus. Uh, Jesus gave the consolamentum to uh, his disciples and then they had, the, you know, so they had this kind of apostolic succession, which went all the way down to the Cathars. That was the, the idea. And, uh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a bit. That, that's a problem if you're kind of neo cathar today. You have to. What do you do if you don't have a. You have to kind of make up a lineage <laughs> to, to back to the ancient cathars. Uh, or I suppose, you know, you could just say that uh, you received the Holy Spirit in another way and you started. The lineage started again or whatever. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so. Uh, so, in fact, in the consolamentum. That's kind of where everything comes together, and that was the, uh, the the center of the religion, really, because you have to understand the myth to understand what's happening with the Holy Spirit descending on you, and um, that uh, uh, if you become perfect and then if you die in good standing as a perfect, your spirit is going to be liberated and go back to the uh, heavenly realm when you die, and, and if you're not. Um, you go and have another life, and maybe you have the chance to meet a Cathar perfect in that life, and uh, uh, I think. But it, that's where it all sort of comes together in the consolamentum ritual, where you get the the myth and the practice and the, all the sort of social side of it so all gelling together. And another interesting practice that they had is that um, the Cathar perfect, the the elite, 
they had to confess their shortfallings in public and uh, the believers, the ordinary Cathars, they could attend and listen to, you know, the, the perfect saying, you know, what mistakes they'd made and everything, which is completely the opposite of, uh, you know, confession. Yeah. The Catholic yeah. Church. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there, there's a lot to admire about them. And, um, you know, they were well liked by the ordinary people. Um, uh, and, and, and then because it wasn't a centralized religion either, everybody had their own take. You know? um, and there were, that, that was one of the interesting questions for me is, for me was actually that, uh, you know, you hear so much about the Cathars in the south of France and the Inquisition and the Robert Jensen Crusade and everything. But you didn't hear so much about the Italian Cathars. And um, they they were kind of quite interesting, but they d didn't have that same sort of uh, uh, romantic aspect to them, you know, of uh, people sacrificing themselves rather than be uh, converted to Catholicism and everything. Um, so the, the the Italian Cathars had lots of arguments between them and <laughs> these between themselves and schisms and um, uh, early but, early Christianity was very disorganized, and uh, I think that's <laughs> that was. The thing they, you know, the church wanted to organize because, again, like you said, there's so many different practices. Some were more liberal than others. And at the end of the day, you know, they all had one set of beliefs, but it, obviously it didn't work out very well. Yeah. And, and they're even, you know, quite theological, these disputes. Because uh, I mentioned about dualism. So, OK, you've got a dualism of spirit and matter. Um, but then you have questions like, has it always been that way? You know, so the Manichaeans who were uh, a Gnostic religion who followed on from the ancient Gnostics and were quite widespread in late antiquity, uh, um, they, they had uh, what's called an absolute dualism. So they thought that, OK, well, there was a realm of light and a realm of darkness, and um, it's always been that way. And the reason that uh, the earth exists is because uh, the realm of darkness started encroaching on the realm of light and there was a battle and um, the earth is a result of that and the earth is like a, a sort of transform transfor uh, an apparatus for um, sorting out the light from the darkness so that um, uh, you know the light the spark of spirit can return to the the world of light and um, leave behind the material side of it uh, so like the Manichaeans and the the Cathars were often called Manichaeans by the um, Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, polemicists at the time and so they were absolute dualists but other people looked at you know at these questions and said okay well that's the state of the world at the moment we have these two different powers light and darkness spirit and matter but it can't have been that way forever it must have being just spirit at the beginning and then something happened uh, the, the, the realm of darkness or the material world whatever you are calling it came into existence and so this is a kind of temporary situation and then the Italian Cathars actually had you know big disputes about uh, which was true and uh, what interpretation you should apply and everything so uh, so they're, they're not quite as appealing as the um, Cathars and the Languedoc. Uh, but uh, anyway, that that was just a, you know a little aspect of Catharism that I wanted to uh, clarify for my own purposes. And, uh, and you uh, mentioned Neo Catharism. Can you touch on that? Yeah. So uh, the Cathars were basically uh, wiped out, and then uh, with the Inquisition moving in, you know, um, they it was very difficult to uh, have any kind of uh, non you know, orthodox, non mainstream uh, beliefs. Um, but there are various stories of uh, how the Cathars might have survived, uh, you know, if maybe, because you, you get, you know, you do get some oddities, like uh, well over 100 years later, you get a guy up in Germany. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on that. <laughs> yeah, About who, the who Holy has... Grail. Oh, oh uh, yeah, okay, that, 
th um, that's a bit later, but there, there was just an ordinary guy up in Germany who gets uh, interviewed by the Inquisition, and his uh, so, so this is you know like a hundred years after the very last Cathar perfect had disappeared, and up in Germany he has Cathar beliefs. Uh, he doesn't know the term Cathar. They they didn't even call themselves Cathars most of the time. You know, they call themselves the good Christians or the, the good men, good women. Um, but uh, you you know you find very similar things cropping up a little bit later. So people have tried to speculate it. Did the Cathars survive in some way? Yeah, yeah, almost like the Nazis that they that they survived. Did Hitler survive? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, Nazism definitely survived. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah it was just rebranded. <laughs> yeah. NASA. Uh, NASA. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so in the 19th century, um, you get actually people in the Languedoc uh, looking back at their own history and um, uh, and it gets sort of it's partly connected with the uh, nationalism of the area you know um, so I, I'm actually you know nationalism is one of those words that has several different meanings everything from Nazi you know, the Nazis to just you know wanting autonomy for your own region and so that was the kind of nationalism that you got in the Languedoc uh, you know, uh, France was being dominated from Paris in the north and uh, had a lack of self-determination, all that kind of stuff. And one of the forms that the you know, 19th century nationalism took uh, was through sort of romantic, romanticism and, uh, you know, the romantic approach to your area's own folklore and culture and uh, all that kind of stuff. So they became very interested in the Cathars, and there were stories of um, about how Cathars had survived and uh, all this kind of stuff. And then this gets taken up by esotericists and occultists, and you get these uh, you know Cathar movements and neo Gnosticism as well. Um, there's sort of in the 19th century neo Gnosticism itself uh, started developing in. France uh, in particular and uh, uh, so that's a whole interesting story itself and um, then you get into the 1920s and there's this guy called Otto Rahn who's a German you know a sort of uh, impecunious uh, uh, romantic young man who's wandering around in the south of France and becomes fascinated by the Holy Grail and by the Cathars and he wrote to uh, uh, a couple of books, uh, the Crusade against the Grail. So he he saw the Albigensian Crusade as actually you know, um, co connected with the Grail itself, and there are these uh, legends about how the interesting uh, the Grail was at the uh, uh, castle of Montségur and all this kind of stuff. It, it's pretty out there, but it's kind of um, There's something about the spirit of it, this, this sort of, you know, yearning, romantic spirit and everything. So, he, so he was, uh, and he was a little bit of a dodgy character himself, you know, like he had, he left owing all these debts to people, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there were all these esoteric, esotericists uh, in the 1920s, wandering around the Languedoc. Uh, you know, there's some, some come over from England as well, and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of in, and there's the, the native interest uh, by people who actually came from the area. Um, so anyway, so he publishes publishes this book, uh, Crusade Against the Grail, and he he gets a letter saying by somebody said, you know, I'd like to uh, if you go up to Paris, I'll pay for your ticket and uh, I'll take you for a meal, and I want to I've got I have a proposal for you. So okay, you know, I'm hitting the big time. Uh, Otto Rahn goes up to Paris. And um, the guy who's meeting with is Heinrich Himmler, uh, you know, the Nazi. And uh, he gets recruited. <laughs> <laughs> he gets re recruited into the sort of non-military side of the uh, SS, I think it is. Uh, and he gets given this budget to go and do research on um, the Grail and you know uh, all this kind of stuff. Which you know, of course, it's a young man's dream. Apart from it's, you know, except uh, these are Nazis. Uh, yeah. He, he could, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't exactly say no. And of course, you know, there's this whole sort of 
esoteric side to the Nazis, uh, everything. Oh but... yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were into some some uh, dark stuff, and it's funny you mentioned that they thought the Crusades were some sort of uh, psyop to find the Holy Grail, and there's so many things like that with conspiracy theories. As far as why World War Two happened, you know, they talk about how it, it was the British and the Germany fighting over UFO extraterrestrial technology. You know, there's that side of it. <laughs> but, yeah, they were fascinated by that stuff. Yeah, they, they were a bunch of uh, witches in Second World War who uh, in Britain, you know, who, uh, who were trying to turn the tide of Nazism and, uh, you know doing rituals to try and uh, <laughs> help the, the British cause in the, in the second Wow. That's, um, I didn't know that. so, so anyway, so Otto Rahn, okay, uh, so he's, you know, got this budget going around doing stuff. And then um, at a certain point, he goes to Austria. He goes up a mountain in Austria and he never comes back down. He's, he's found dead of exposure. And uh, it seems like it was quite like the... Uh, suicide uh which is uh you know not a bad uh, <laughs> way to get out of uh <laughs> you know helping the nazis in uh, world war Two. so so it's this kind of uh there's a strange story um it's, you know sad story uh but uh, plenty of s- sadder stories in the second world war i'll tell you <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, we can we can wrap up with um, with just one more question, Andrew. Yeah, sure. <laughs> You're the first person that I've asked this question to, and when I made that trailer, I I had done it uh, in order to uh, make it appealing in a way <laughs> to people, but. <laughs> Andrew, is it okay to shave your face with the same machine you use on your balls? <laughs> uh, so it depends what kind of machine it is, you know. Like if <laughs> if, if it's like a lawnmower, then yeah, I say go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's that's good to know. Um, Andrew, one more time, uh, where can people find your work if they want to dive deeper into the Cathars and and read your books? Obviously, you have other, you've written numerous books on Gnosticism. Uh, uh, can you give your website one more time? Yeah, it's andrewphillipsmith.com. Uh, Andrew Philip Smith's all one word, two L's in Philip. Uh, it's bardicpress.com, uh, the hyphen Gnostic.com. And you can just search my name on Amazon. Um, you know, I've written seven or eight books, I think it is. Uh, most recent one was a collection of essays on all different aspects of Gnosticism called uh, Gnostic Tendencies. And that, that has some biographical stuff at the uh, beginning that people found quite interesting, uh, autobiographical rather. Uh, and just, you know, has a translation of the Gospel of Thomas, an esoteric interpretation of the Gospel of Thomas and, uh, you know, essays and all different aspects of Gnosticism. Um, if you're looking for a good place to start, I would say uh, the secret history of the Gnostics. Um, if you started reading Gnostic writings and you're bewildered, I did a dictionary of Gnosticism, um, which will help you look up all those difficult Greek words and the gobbledygook and those yeah. terms you come across. Uh, and then the lost teachings of the Cathars, uh, which is you know, what it says on the uh, label. Um, the book about the Mandeans, um, John the Baptist and the last Gnostics. Um, the, the Mandeans are a, a religion and ethnic group who survived up to the uh, current time in Iraq and Iran, um, whose beliefs are very Gnostic. Uh, they, they do these weekly uh, immersive baptisms. Dare to say a cult of John the Baptist? <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, um, he... They, they don't think of John the Baptist as their founder, but he was an important prophet. Um, but when, you know, they were being, uh, when Christians were encountering them in like the sort of 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and um, when, you know, they were living in uh, majority Muslim 
countries as well. So John the Baptist was often a sort of convenient figure for them to say, look, uh, we're like you, we're an Abrahamic religion, we're people of the book, we have scriptures, uh, John the Baptist, okay, you know, he was a prophet. Uh, but there, there's a lot more to their religion than, than just, you know. The yeah, Baptist. perhaps, perhaps we can do an episode on them because I find that very interesting as well. Um, yeah, sure. But yeah, uh, thank you so much again, Andrew. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for being on. And again, hopefully we could set something else up and talk about some more uh, gnosis or <laughs> or heresies, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, thanks very much, man. Well, there you have it. That was Andrew Philip Smith. Check out his work if you want to also dive into a wormhole. Uh, remember to follow us on social media at the one on one podcast. Uh, also check out our blog, the one on one podcast.com. And you can shoot me an email if you want to be on the show, if you have something interesting to talk about. My email is the one on one podcast at gmail.com. And until next time. Mm-hmm.